Welcome back, folks. I'm Jake Ellenbogen. He is Gary Sheffield Jr. And you are watching Yankees Unloaded. Unfortunately, you're watching it after a Yankees defeat, 4-3 to uh, to the Angels, who just won their 21st game of the season, something the Yankees did May 3rd. Uh, so that's obviously a stinger there. Uh, before we dive into it, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Also, be sure to follow us on all social media uh, at Yankees Unloaded, at Gary Sheffield Jr., and at J.K. Bogan. Gary, let's start off the show because, I mean, I don't know how much people want to even talk about this game. We will talk about it. But let's start off the show with an interesting little uh, article or like an excerpt from an article that Bob Nightingale put out that I thought was really interesting. We on this channel have talked multiple times about the idea that Aaron Judge playing center field isn't sustainable. And it's not even an idea. It's not even an opinion. It's a fact. Uh, Father time always catches up with us. We all know no matter what you're doing in life, always catches up and wins in the end. Um, playing center field is a demanding position. It's a position that takes a lot of athleticism. It takes, you know, a lot of conditioning and it, you know, you're asked essentially to cover a lot of ground when you're a six foot seven, 200 and I don't know, 60 to 280 pound player. That is a lot of wear and tear. I mean, this is how I would take it, Gary. You know how you have to pay tolls on the highway because, you know, mainly that is geared at truck drivers because truck drivers, they, they put a lot of wear and tear on the highway. Well, why? Because they weigh so much. So all that weight is basically pounding down on the roads. And so the roads depreciate over time. That's why you pay the tolls. Tolls eventually are used to fix said roads. It's the cost of doing that. Well, Aaron Judge is paying a toll whether we realize it or not by being six foot seven and 280 pounds when you're running out there in the outfield as opposed to just playing first base or DHing, you're putting a lot of wear and tear you're putting a lot of a, a lot of pressure on your feet on your legs on your knees all that and so i've said for a while and this article wasn't just really the yankees it was more so Teams like executives around the league were like, that's the one thing judge is really hot right now. But the one thing that's concerning is that he's playing center field and it's behind a paywall. So, I mean, I didn't read the full thing, but Gary, what are your thoughts on all that? Because I mean, I, I think it's a genuine like issue and it's something we're bringing up yet again, because even though judge didn't get hurt last night or anything like that, God forbid, um, this article came out today, and I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it it doesn't really take an expert, right? And Bob's not claiming to be an expert, or all these guys aren't claiming to be experts to bring this opinion forward. Because when you're 6'7", 280, like you mentioned, you can assume it's not going to help you, okay? Um, it didn't help Giancarlo Stanton being 6'4", 6'5", 235 pounds, being, being a big and bulky. Most of the players in Major League Baseball that you consider Ironmen of the game aren't 6'5", 250. There's a reason for that. The average Hall of Famer is 5'11", probably a buck 95. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that there's a rule to be healthy, you have to be that size. But based on, based on what we've seen in history, we can make a guess as to what's more sufficient. Now, having said all that, we said before the season started that Aaron Judge probably shouldn't be playing center field. Um, it's the reason why we looked at other options in center, uh, whether it be people like Kiermaier, some other fits around baseball to join this team. It's not that we thought Kevin Kiermaier or anybody else was a better center fielder than Aaron Judge. It's about what version of Aaron Judge are we seeing in 2024 and beyond? Because this player, regardless of what you feel about Aaron Judge right now, he is going to be a Yankee until, so if you're 21 years old, he's going to be there till you're 30. That's a long time. It's a really, it's a long marriage. So you want to protect that asset the best you can. And I feel like this article is just kind of walking us towards the inevitable, which is that a 32 year old, six foot seven, the guy who's the size of a small forward in the NBA, he probably should be protected. The Yankees are playing it as if, okay, this is just a short-term solution. 
He'll be in center. We love Soto and Wright. Verdugo is a great option for us in the short term, but things can kind of, they're fluid, right? Next year, Aaron Judge could be playing right field. You don't, we don't know if Soto is going to be back. We don't actually have an answer to that question yet, but we don't know what the few, we don't know what 2025 looks like in Yankee land. So that's the crazy part. Um, so I love what this article is kind of introducing, which is that the Yankees aren't putting Aaron judge, who's their best player in the best position to be there in the future. So I just think it's interesting. And I agree. I think that the Yankees should probably do a better job of protecting their assets. But Jake, we mentioned it last show. We haven't won a World Series since 2009. The best place for Aaron Judge and Juan Soto and Verdugo to be in the short term is where they are. So it's hard for me to say that the Yankees should be making moves that protect assets for the future when it's hard to stare at the future when you haven't got it done in the present in that long. So that's the that's the thing that I try to at least extend an olive branch towards what the Yankees are doing because I think the Yankees are that starved to win to where they might sacrifice some of the future to get over the hump right now. I hear you, man. And, I, you know, I feel like, you know, in center field, I mean, you had touched on this before we went live that Jason Dominguez is playing center field right now in Shocking. double A. Mm-hmm. I mean, are, are they maybe prepping? Do you think maybe they're they're prepping? If if I mean, I know they'd probably never do this because it's a very I don't want to say favoritism, but they love these guys. I mean, Boone is a a player's manager. If we're being honest, he is. That's why I was so so, uh, shocked to see him call out Glaber the other day. But he is a player's manager, and. I don't think they would ever do this, but like Anthony Rizzo has not played a good first base this year. And you brought this to my attention. And of course it's one of those things like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And now every time, because you brought that one time on one of the shows, you know, Oh, Rizzo's always Rizzo's playing out of position yeah. And the pitcher yeah. has to run a hundred miles an hour to get to first, which I mean, we talked about puts him in a bad spot because now, you know, the leg gets in a tough position where you're hitting the bag and maybe you're running into the the runner. Just not a great spot to be in. Ideally, you don't want the pitcher covering first base. Ideally, you want that ball that Rizzo loves to go after to go to the second baseman who has an easy throw and your first baseman to, you know, cover first base. That is not what is happening. And it actually, I don't want to say it costs them the game, but it very well could have cost them the game. Oh, I will. It, that cost it, them the damn game. That's what I think. Are you? You do. With it? Yeah, I do think that. And well, I mean, I don't know. There, there, see the there, I don't want to. Rizzo when he came into the dugout. What? Did you see his body language when he came into the dugout? He walked into the dugout. And if you want to know whose fault was that, okay? Whose it, fault was that play? Whose fault was that inning? Now, you can't just like usually throw all fault onto one player, but pay attention to who the Yes broadcast puts on the screen when the inning ends, okay? Final pitch is made. There's Michael K is about to say, and we're headed to break. Who's on camera around that time? Anthony Rizzo was on camera. They talk about the error. They talk about the blunder. You take they did rule it a hit today, which is ridiculous. (laughs) Ridiculous. (laughs) He was not ready for that. I didn't prep him for that. (laughs) You didn't prep me for that. I wish I. I wish I was prepped for it. I want to dump water over the top of my head. It was an error. Okay, and it was not a hard play. He he dove, so they can't give him an error. (laughs) He should just start. He should just start on his side so that he can't make any more errors the rest of the season. We pay Glaber Torres $14 million roughly a year to field ground balls at second base. If you can't go three feet to your right and field the ball cleanly, not a hard play at all. That play for Anthony Rizzo, given what I've seen from him over the course of time, that was not a difficult play at all. 
this is now defensively at least because offensively i absolutely love what rizzo's brought to the table um hovering around 250 he's a great at bat um he doesn't give up with two strikes he's making quality outs productive outs which i've talked about all year it's part of the reason this offense has taken such like such strides forward but that said jake what is going on defensively we can't get off the base. We can't make decisions. Oh, that's my ball. That's the second baseman's ball. We can't make proper feeds to first base. We can't make the decision to field the ball and just take it yourself. The majority of ground balls to first base should be walked over to first base by the first baseman. The majority. I know. I know. I I really, I don't know. I'm getting tired of it, man. It's It's every game. I mean, Torres is there. He's there. If, if, you know, Rizzo covers first, Torres feels that that's the end of the inning. Yankees win this game. So, yeah, I mean, to your point, they did lose the game because of that. But you pointed something out on uh, Twitter, which doesn't exist, that I want to point out because I thought it was a great point. So people were bagging on Torres, right? Mm-hmm. They were bagging on Torres for getting thrown out at home. That's not on Torres. Why is he getting sent home? As you pointed out on Twitter, you're like, that was a bad send. And I agree because he was dead. Like it wasn't even close. Is Glaber fast? No. So if you let's remember this. Glaber Torres is standing on second base, okay? The ball heads into the outfield. When you're running towards third base, your only decision as a guy who's a base runner at second base is, is it safe for me to run to third base? Now, if based on the context clues of what's happening in front of you and you make the decision to go to third, you also make the decision, I'm probably going to have an opportunity to be sent home here. Now, let's remember, where is the base runner looking? The base runner's taught as he's rounding third base not to be turning his head and looking into the field. No. The replay, if you watch baseball a lot, you'll see in slow-mo, runners are not turning their heads and looking to make decisions. It is quite literally why we pay a man to stand by third base and tell the runner what he's doing, what you're seeing. Okay, so anytime you watch the replay and you say, Why exactly did that guy decide to go home? The base runner has no part in that decision. Base runners only make decisions on pass balls to go home or to second or to third, right? Or going first to third because the play's in front of you. You're looking. You can see the entire field. But anytime a player's going home, last year, do you remember Giancarlo Stan where he looked like he was in a wheelchair going home? Well, Giancarlo didn't decide to go home there. That was a decision deliberately made by our third base coach. It had nothing to do with Giancarlo. You can blame him for the running. Obviously, the reason he was running that way was because of his health. We didn't really dive deep into it. It just looked funny, so we made fun of it. But the real thing to take away here is that Giancarlo nor Glaber Torres made the conscious decision, I'm running home here. They were told to. So if you're mad at anybody... Be mad at the coach. Had nothing to do with Glaber there. We'll blame him for errors, right? Lackadaisical plays, being lazy on defense in general, or not hitting for the first two months of the season. But that is one area of baseball that you can't blame him for because he can't be running to third base and then turn your head while you're sprinting home. It just, your body doesn't work that way. So let's cut him some slack there. So... You mentioned speed, so while you were talking, I looked up MLB The Show ratings. We're going to play, we're going to have a guessing game. First off, I want you to guess Giancarlo Stanton's speed rating. Giancarlo Stanton's speed rating should probably be, probably 26. No, it's a nine. There you go. (laughs) Glaber Torres is probably like a, a 31. 40. Okay. But there you go. If you're, I'm sorry, but if you have a 40 speed rating in MLB The Show, not saying video games run the world or anything, but 40 speed rating in MLB The Show, and they're sending you home, you know, from third, I'll say this right now. 
that ball better still be in the outfield and they're rummaging around trying to pick it up. That I mean, that is that is insanity. And, and the, the arms that are in the outfield in this league. I mean, you have guys that can throw it 120 miles an hour from right field on no hops. Well, I guess <laughs> it doesn't even matter how good the arms are. He was out by 30 feet. It wasn't, oh, there was wasn't no even play close. made. It was catch. Major League Baseball players, like despite what people might think, they are. I think he was ruled out better. of the baseline before he got tagged. That's how bad he, that, that's how bad it was. Yeah, he was out by 35 feet. There was no like, play. There's nothing he made. could do. It didn't matter. No, I would argue that it didn't matter who was playing outfield, infield, like who was making the relays. Any combination of outfielder and infielder there. would have 100%. You and I are 100%. throwing out Glaber there, no doubt about it. <laughs> We're also throwing out Stanton. Um, <laughs> I keep thinking about that earlier in the season game. We never actually touched on it, but like because we were just laughing so much off air. The one where Stanton was jogging to third, and then he, they sent him home, and he Which, just by like the way, walked. <laughs> there's just an understanding from Giancarlo, okay? Because if you watch Giancarlo play. It's not that he's lazy. He is not. Okay. No. He is not a lazy player. He's and no been point, told he can't been run. He's Absolutely. He's literally not allowed to run. It's a decision. It is a decision of do you want me to run and there is a serious opportunity for me to get hurt? Or do you want me to protect myself and allow me to be valuable for the for the future and the present? Which is crazy because Giancarlo's basically telling you, don't send me unless somebody who is jogging would make it. Okay? That's the yeah. decision. Labor Torres, you just said he's like a 30-some speed, 40 speed. He, unless he could make it home, like anyone would be able to score. You know how David Ortiz is on second base? Like if David Ortiz was on second and somebody hits a ball in the gap, the slowest players in Major League Baseball would score on a ball in the gap from second base, no matter who yeah. you are. You could be the slowest player in Major League Baseball. The way the bases are configured, you'll make it home. Okay? That's what Absolutely. you know. Okay? So if Giancarlo stands on first base, no matter where the ball's hit in the outfield, he knows I'm stopping at third base. That's just inherently what it is. So if it is Glaber Torres, if it is um, maybe not Wells, because he actually runs exceptional, um, but Rizzo, Stan, I know. right? Soto, balls in the gap. We're not station to station. But we're not blazing the base paths. This that's not the way this team was built. Okay. Anthony Volpe scoring from first base on a ball in the gap from Soto or Judge. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe you can get away with Verdugo and Wells. And his helmet is Absolutely. coming off within the first two steps. Absolutely. <laughs> but who are, what are we th- it was like they thought Glaber Torres, last thing I'll say about him, we'll move on. I it was like they thought Glaber Torres was invisible. The Angels are still a major league baseball team. They know how to run a basic relay play. That was a high school play. They were never scoring there. Boneheaded play happens when you analyze every game. People make mistakes. The coaches are no exception. We pointed out. How did the Yankees not jump all over Griffin Canning? Well, probably the same way they didn't jump on Joe Musgrove. Uh, we, we've. The Yankees have kind of played up to their competition this year, which is a good thing because it leads you to play well against teams over 500. But at the same time, when you go play the Oaklands and you go play the Chicago White Sox and then you come into Anaheim and you lay down and you relax and say, okay, well, we got it done against Houston. We got it done against all these other teams. We look really good against San Diego. And then you you move on to Anaheim. And everyone's presuming, oh, okay, this is going to be an easy three-game series. Maybe we'll get a little park hopper, go over to Disneyland. <laughs> no. That's not the way baseball works. These are big leaguers. Uh, Canning is a big leaguer. His numbers might be butt, but guess what? There's a reason that there's a game played at 638 tonight. It's because there's an opportunity where he can still get it done. It's exactly what happened. We went out there and we got hits, but we didn't get it done when it mattered. Guys in scoring position, we didn't make quality outs. And we paid for it. Uh, yeah, Holmes came in and we wet the sheets. But Jake, like I said before, you can't always rely on relievers to get the job done. Like over the course of a season, they're going to be a strong suit for us. But when you go out and score three runs against the Anaheim Angels of Anaheim or Orlando, wherever they are, <laughs> you cannot expect to win. 
we didn't get it done offensively. We had nine hits. None of it was of any of authority outside of Juan Soto. Actually, I'm pretty sure Juan Soto was responsible for every single run this game, if I'm not mistaken. So, I think he no no. Wells, so he, uh, well, he, so he Wells drove didn't drive him home. Right. Yeah, so he, he drove in two, and then Wells two. had the double. Yes. So that's insane. <clears throat> Juan Soto drove in. He so he drove in himself and somebody mm-hmm. else, and then somebody else. So okay, so Juan Soto was a he was available for two thirds of our offense. We didn't really get it done. Volpe had a decent night at the plate, two for five. Right, like a lot of guys had hits. Judge, Verdugo, Stanton, Torres, Wells, they all had knocks. But what happened uh, when we clogged the base pass and, you know, we needed to get it done? I thought I one positive I will bring out of this, you kind of mentioned this earlier, was that DJ LeMahieu actually looked pretty decent at the plate. I actually liked his at-bats, loved the contact. Ball was not flying. Had it been, I mean, maybe we're talking about a two, three-run homer from LeMahieu late in the game, which would have been amazing. That right but- field, they had an industrial fan blowing. <laughs> there, I mean, there's there's no way. The first one, uh, Austin Wells, how is that not a home run? Sounded amazing, looked amazing, and then it just dies right at the wall. And you're like, what? And then the same damn thing happens to Juan Soto at the end of the game. I thought for sure that was gone, Gary. I thought for sure that was gone. We were about to see Judge. That's what I thought. Uh, it would have been a tie ball game with Judge coming up. And yeah, that was old that school. Been fun. Old school to see uh, a night game in LA or just California in general. Remember those days where you used to watch like Petco Park, and the ball just wouldn't <laughs> go anywhere. But now it's like every ball flies out. So it was weird to see that happen. Um, obviously, no excuses. The Angels are playing with the same dimensions, same jet stream. That I'm we had. very much kidding. Obviously, they they don't have an yeah. industrial fan. <laughs> but it, felt, it literally felt like there was just a fan blowing. It, it yeah. really did. It really did feel like that, but yeah. It, as soon it was as it got close to the right. wall, clearly it wasn't yeah. blowing and left because that uh, the Clay Holmes hit that he gave up to Taylor Ward to. He's he's a good he's a good baseball player, you know. They, they turned it's, the fan off. Yeah, they turned it off. Uh, the Kevin Pillar uh, tweet that you had, just I could oh, I could feel that. For him? that yeah, because Kevin hilarious. Pillar is Mike Trout. All of a sudden, Mike Trout goes down. Kevin Pillar enters the show and he is Mike Trout now. Um, I don't know if we've pulled up his numbers. I actually want to, because I think that would be really interesting. Pilar? I, yeah, I really, yeah, I'm He's pulling up his 349. numbers. He had 349. He went three for four last night, obviously had the home run. He's always done some stuff against the Yankees uh, from what I remember. But I mean, yeah, he's got over a thousand OPS. I mean, underrated player in general. He was really good for Toronto. I mean, but I mean, he's not a guy. His 349 is kind of feeling a lot like uh, what's his name from San Diego, um, the dude Profar, where it's oh, like, yeah. hey, this guy's potential and he has a solid big league career. Pilar, 259 career hitter, 112 bombs. So he's been a comparable hitter for some time. But did I expect to see Kevin Pilar undo us in the opening game of this series? No, I didn't. So that was shocking to see. But, you know, good for them. Uh, they don't really have much going positive for them. Oh, by the way, I, Jake, uh, I saw a little a little quote, um, something from Blake Snell, which was I just thought was interesting because it it coincides so much with what we said. And Blake Snell, he was talking about the narrative of him being a second half hitter, and he said I became way more dominant in the second half because of how much I learned in the first half. Right now, it's just a late start, rushing to get back. An injury, it's just been frustrating. And I thought that was actually a really interesting thing to say because in general, we talked about that late start and how that fit might not work with the Yankees. And, you know, we've talked about it, so we won't like harp on it too much, but I just think that's so interesting because it's almost like he's at war with Scott Boris and that whole idea that who the hell cares when we sign? I'll show up, I'm going to be ready. Because remember, he said that. Scott Boris said it. My player's ready. And he implied he's ready as if he'd been doing anything. But based on what Blake Snell is saying, he actually, and this is a quote, I was facing high school hitters. Well, what does that say about Scott Boris? He's going to tell you my client is ready when he's facing high school hitters. He's not ready. Guys, I'm telling you, guys are going to fire Scott Boris. He's going to lose his place if he hasn't already. 
That was a really bad offseason. I mean, how if you are one of the top players in the game and you're shopping for an agent, how do you go? That's the guy I want. The guy who turned Cody Bellinger from a 13 year contract player that we were talking about preseason yep. to a guy who settled for what a three year deal. With yeah, because the that, that deal was good for Bellinger. They said, "Oh, well, three years, ninety million, or whatever the hell you got, well, this is a good deal." I go, "No, it's a good contract for you and I to sign for eighty-five million. It's a lot of money." But if Not I good. told you that Aaron Judge signed for a two-year, hundred million dollar contract, fifty million a year, but contract ends in twenty twenty-five, would you still think it was a good contract? You wouldn't, because doesn't you'd he say, represent no. Correa too? I'm not sure. That's actually a good question. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Correa's okay. contracts were bad. Oh, let me let me actually I'm looking it up right this second. Carlos, give me. I'm not the best typer, so you get you gotta you gotta bear Oh with yeah, me. he does two, the whole finger. I'm the two finger <laughs> typer, so you gotta bear with me. <laughs> Who is his agent? Um no, I don't see anything. You'll find it I'll immediately. Find it. <laughs> you you hear me typing away. You're like, oh god, yeah, good god. I'm Boris. gonna guess it's, it's Boris. So I was right. Uh, yeah. I mean, six years, two hundred million. Why? Why only six years? Oh, so well, you're talking about Correa. Yeah. Well, the reason he got six years is remember it was because of that injury and in his physical. So. He took his physical, which you you knew this story. He took yeah. his physical, failed it, and then all of a sudden he pivoted and everyone said, oh my gosh, look at Steve Cohen. He's, he's stealing Carlos Correa. Then they saw his physical and was like, oh, this ankle is in terrible shape. Remember that? And then yeah. they tried to change the contract. They were like, well, hold on a second. We want opt-outs. That's how bad it looked. And then the twins, who obviously have nothing to lose because no one wants to play there, uh, they went ahead and gave him the contract. Now all of a sudden he just kind of went back with his with his ex. That's essentially what happened. Um, is what it is. We were kind of. I was actually really wanting Carlos Correa. I thought he was proven in the postseason, all that stuff. But you know, long story short, he got that bad contract because of his health. But Blake Snell, Blake Snell was kind of in the similar boat to a Rodon. Rodon has some great years. He has some buns years. Bad. You're like, who's this guy? And then you say, and then a couple people give up on him, and then others will say, hey, well, I really like the stuff. I think it plays. I like the spin. Put him with that staff. Oh, he got off to a hot start in spring training. Next thing you know, Blake Snell and Rodon are like these aces. But what happens if they're off schedule, right? Like what happens if a Blake Snell or Rodon deals with what Garrett Cole's dealing with right now? Well, they might not get off the mat for a whole year. We saw it with Rodon last year. He was atrocious bad in every way he wasn't good at anything right uh, we had all these types of people defending him making excuses people in the comments for snell right now are saying he's making excuses yeah it looks like you're making excuses hire a better agent that puts you in a position to succeed because you're not good enough to make up for this shortcoming you are not a good enough pitcher to skip a month and a half of preparation and just show up and be ready to go so that's like the cold reality that I don't think enough of these reporters are bringing up. These guys are not good enough players in general to just skip the process. They need to do every single step in order from the jump to make sense of a major contract. And I don't think that Blake Snell really considered that. I don't think any of these players considered that. And so that's why Jake and I, you both like, we, we said, like, this is not a good deal at all. So it is interesting to see this because he looks like Rodon last year. Yeah. No, I I definitely hear you. And uh, going back to, um, you know, Boris, there's only two guys on the roster that have Boris representing him, Soto and Rodon. I just went through. Everyone else, Wasserman and CAA, Stroman is clutch sports. Oh, I saw what's his name was talking to Boris Aaron Aaron Boone. He was talking to Boris yesterday, I believe. I think he was in the crowd. He was like sitting right by an own plate. He was talking to him. I don't know what he goes to the games for. I don't either. Is he going to talk business? Because right now we've just got a bunch of 
just a bunch of people giving us quotes for the media to like make one side look bad. You've got Hal Steinbrenner saying, well, I'm always open to talk business. It's like, oh no shit. You're trying, you're ready to stop, talk business <laughs> with a guy who's hitting 330 in pinstripes. Of course you are. But hopefully Volpe doesn't hire yet. him. Hopefully he doesn't. Cause by the way, if Anthony Volpe hires Scott Boris, it essentially means that, and it doesn't guarantee it because we see it with Altuve, perfect example. If he tells you what he wants, but it takes a special type of player to where, and it's, it also is dependent on how it starts. Cause you have to remember Carlos Correa or not Carlos Correa, um, Jose Altuve, his, his, I like guess his whole story is that he had a walk on, essentially a walk on performance. So the Astros are literally the only team that gave him a chance. No other team in Major League Baseball even wanted to look his way. The Yankees could have had him, the Red Sox, Dodgers, all these teams could have had Altuve, but they chose to just look the other way. So that story is the reason that he's in Houston today. And he can just tell Boris, do your job and get this contract done. But most other players, most sane people just say, get me the most money possible. Make me the most money. And a lot of times, Jake, unfortunately, the most money doesn't resonate with the team you're already in. And people who are listening to our podcast right now know this inherently. They actually know this before they join the show today. What's the best way to get a raise from your work? Quit and go somewhere else. You ask your boss for a raise and what do they tell you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we can give you a 3% raise. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, or what do they do? They send a pepperoni pizza from Papa John's to your front doorstep. Does a Sheikah Island deliver that? <laughs> they do. They do. But Jake, am I wrong? Your your business doesn't want to give you a raise, but that other business no. down the street does. They want to get you through the door. That that was the Giants in the whole Aaron Judge situation. And then of course he leveraged it back and his old employer matched that offer. But we almost didn't. So, yeah. The whole Boris thing, please, for the love of God, Volpe, stay away from the guy. <laughs> oh, man. that I, I don't even want to think about that. Um, so, yeah. 4-3. That game sucked. Um, you know, losing to the Angels, not great. But um, today, Louis Seal is on the mound, taking on Tyler Anderson, Anderson's given up seven homers this year, but has a good ERA at 252, 1.06 whip. Um, he goes at you, you know, he's not like a power pitcher or anything, but, you know, he's trying to generate soft contact and, um, you know, he's not going to pitch around you. So that'll be interesting because last night we saw, you know, late in the game, they were pitching around Soto. I think they planned on pitching around Judge. Um, so we'll see what ends up happening. I think really... You know, 9.38 Eastern time. Uh, I mean, Yankees coming off a loss are probably the team that no one wants to play. <laughs> like, it just, they're they're not a team that loses tons of games in a row. Um, and, I mean, Heels is going to be on the mound, and he's trying to get that whip under one. And, I mean, Heels chasing a Cy Young, in my opinion. I think he's got Rookie of the Year wrapped up if he continues this, but... I mean, 70 strikeouts, only 27 hits given up, 55 innings, only three home runs. I mean, he's he's chasing the Cy Young. And these are these are the performances where voters will look like, okay, you were good against this team. Will you be good against the bad teams as well? Because guess what? You're going to be playing a lot of bad teams from here on out. You're playing a lot of good teams, but these teams also matter and I don't even want to call the Angels bad. I think they're just kind of mediocre. You know, I don't think they're the, they're not the Rockies. You know, they're not the oh, White yeah, Sox. Rockies, White Sox, yeah. But yeah. by the way, another thing that we I feel like we have to bring up, or it'd be almost negligent to bring to skip it, is that when Garrett Cole comes back, we obviously know Luis Hill is going to be a part of this rotation. He's our two now. Well, Absolutely. He's facing the other teams too as well. Like. Garrett Cole doesn't just match up with some other team's random pitcher. A lot of times people try to time their best arm against ours to give themselves a chance. Well, Luis Heal isn't going to be seeing the other team's ace anymore. So I like that. I really like it. It gives them an even better opportunity to take over a game. And frankly, I like what, um, what Luis Heal is doing in terms of his control. He's getting deeper into games. And when you're going against another team's two, I'm here to tell you, Jake, you know this. 
a lot of teams twos and threes they don't go five or six innings anymore like that's that's just like a thing of the past it's almost like status quo to go three and a third four and a third and that's just like what you see now so Luis Hill is really going to have the edge there and as far as Anderson goes like you said he's a guy who's going to come right after you it's a weird thing to see because our team in general we kind of feed off the walk and putting traffic out there and then leaving the yard but what happens when a team is going right after you what happens if they're going to force you to swing the bat the Yankees are going to have to hit today and they kind of did yesterday they didn't cash in they're going to have to get it done when it matters I agree, man. I think uh, today will be a different outcome. I feel good. Anytime Luis Seals on the mound, I feel really good. And it's weird. I like Nestor, but I never feel like the Yankees are going to come out and just dominate with Nestor. I feel like Nestor's kind of the weaker link of everybody in the rotation, Um, but he's also kind of the leader at the same time. It's a weird dynamic. Um, But yeah, you, you can't lose this series to the Angels. I'm sorry, you just can't. So you got to come out, you got to show, you know, some aggression there, but yeah, that's all I got. I'm sure that's all you got. Um, MLB draft is uh, fast approaching. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll start, you know, looking at some mock drafts and seeing who they think is going to go to the Yankees and, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. That's just something that was on my mind. So we, cause uh, we feel like we're actually pretty comfortable with the catchers. Right. And then, we might yeah. be projecting Aaron Judge to move over to first base, but who we got at second base and third base, right? Because it seems like we got a whole bunch of question marks out there that well, maybe I think we the, can address the, with the draft. The question is because the draft comes before the trade deadline. So the question is, and this is why you can learn a lot based on a first round selection in the MLB draft. Yes. The Yankees last year, Surprised a lot of people when they drafted Lombard Jr., the shortstop. They're like, mm-hmm. huh, I keep hearing about Arias. They have Volpe. They have Oswaldo Cabrera. They have Peraza. What are they telling us? And I think it's a fair question. Then they get Vivas in the trade with the Dodgers. You have all these middle infielders. So we'll see what happens. If they draft another infielder, Gary, in the first round, I think that's just screaming, hey, one of those guys don't go out and get comfortable, don't get their jersey, don't do because we're we're shipping them off at the deadline. That's what that kind of tells us. So yeah, shipping a surplus is always a good thing. So we'll see what they do. I mean, they also had like Sweeney from before as well. So they Well, yeah, they trade Sweeney a lot. Yeah, they're <laughs> not they're not uncomfortable drafting a shortstop, which of course you draft a shortstop just means he's pretty much him in the center fielder best athlete on the field that's fine um but could still, also be best player field. available yeah it could always be that because the yankees are as a team who can spend money they're going to look at players from a value standpoint and not necessarily fit because they can always just throw some valuable asset to an oakland for miller and then be like all right well we traded him because i mean he's valuable to them that's the reason we took them. So a lot of other organizations, they have to draft and then put them in there. They have to play well. And then you sign them to contract extensions and all that whole jazz. All of it's got to happen. For the Yankees, it doesn't. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, and another big thing, <clears throat> keep this in mind because this is important. You also have to make sure that a guy's going to sign with you. The Yankees drafted Garrett Cole. They drafted him at the end of the first round. Garrett Cole said... Nope, I want to go back to college. He went back to college. He became the number one overall pick, and he goes to the Pirates. And that probably, that right there, not Garrett Cole necessarily, but that aspect of the draft, is probably why it's not as big as the NFL draft. It's probably what is holding it back. Because people look at that, and they're like, oh, the best players in the draft aren't even going to come out. Like they, And they do come out, but they don't sign, and then they go back to school. I would say... As we wrap this up, they need to do away with that. In in the NBA draft, they they just added so now you can go into the draft, test the waters, get, you know, I, I guess feedback from executives and so forth. And if you're getting good feedback, it's your decision. You can stay in the draft 
or you can go back to college. That's how it should be. I don't think you should be able to have both of the things. I don't think you should be able to go through, get picked, and then decide, you know what? I don't really want to play in the athletics organization, so I'm going to go back to school. Or, you know what? I was drafted 30th overall, but I'll get a little bit more money if I'm drafted number one overall. So I'm going to go back to school to try to be the number one overall pick. And We were never going to get that value back. As soon as we drafted Garrett Cole late in the first round, Anything they gave us after that, you can give us next year's late first rounder, or hell, you can even move it to the middle of the first round. We're not no, getting the uh, value that we lost. We would have much rather just back. have Garrett Cole. Yeah, it sets us back. So it's just stupid. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully it, they change that. I guess we'll see. I mean, you know, I, I say that now, but Aaron Judge, I'm pretty sure, was drafted by the A's. I mean, like in the 18th round or whatever. That actually, the Yankees drafted. So I think it was Don Mattingly because they didn't think he would. He wouldn't sign, so they got him in like the 28th round, and then he ended up signing? Well, I don't know, but I do know who did change all the rules for the Major League Baseball draft, and it was actually a player by the name of Zach Davies, for those of you who are real baseball fans, and he pitched for the Arizona Diamondbacks last year, but he signed, I believe, with the Baltimore Orioles out of high school. Now, out of high school, he told Arizona State that he would be going there and he told the rest of major league baseball, all scouts everywhere, all the other 29 teams, I will not be signing with you. And then later in the rounds in the 30th, some 20th, some round, he was selected by the Baltimore Orioles to which they gave him a hefty signing bonus. And that did not sit well with major league baseball. And that's why you see currently today, all of those, uh, the little pie charts about why players get paid where they get paid. But that's where it stems from. So I thought that was interesting. I played with him in high school, so it was kind of crazy. He got like a $600,000 signing bonus in like the 35th round, so it was nuts. That is crazy. It's That's funny too. Um, yeah, it was Don Mattingly. Uh, 1979 MLB draft, 19th round. Didn't actually have any interest in attending college. Went right to the Yankees. Um, a lot of teams backed off him because they thought that that was kind of just a ruse and that he was absolutely going to go to college and he was just kind of testing the water and the Yankees in the 19th round are like, we have nothing left to lose. It's a, a 19th round pick. I mean, that every other draft doesn't even have that. So, <laughs> you know, that ended up working out in their favor, but yeah, it's uh it's always interesting. I wish the MLB draft, though, would be a little bit more organized. It's kind of hard to follow. It's like uh, trying to get into NASCAR, and they have all these different rules and penalties. Oh, it's like, I don't think it ever will. They, I don't think they'll ever get no. it situated. If you really think about it, they, they don't draft care somebody, about the, You don't yeah. see them. That dude's going down to rookie ball. You could ask somebody who's a diehard fan, hey, where's your rookie? where's your rookie team play? And have you actually been to that city and attended one of their games? The answer is most likely no. Most likely, not a single Yankees fan has gone to go watch their rookie ball or their high A team play. Um, they know some guys on double A AA and triple A, you know, as you start to creep closer to the major leagues. But that process is long for a lot of guys. Holiday, for example, in Baltimore, he went up to the major leagues. Now he's back to triple A. He could be down there in triple A until next year, spring training. That's a long process. Could you imagine if like Trevor Lawrence got drafted in the NFL and they're like, see you in three and a half years, we wouldn't cover the NFL draft the way that we cover it because there's such a fast turnaround there where you just get to see, okay, Kyler Murray, they draft, you know, they get Maserati. Now they've got this big receiving core. I can't wait to see that. Not three years from now, right now. That's the cool part. So yeah, that it's, it's cool from a standpoint of our audience because the way we've built this Yankees podcast is that these people that listen to our show care about the details. They care about who's coming into their system where a lot of people say they do, but they forget about them for four years. So we care and we'll cover it. And, and I think it's going to be interesting. So let's wait until the draft is like kind of approaching. And I do think we should dabble. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think like to your point, you know, we're always keeping an eye on, you know, what's going on in the farm system. And right now they got, uh, like you had previously mentioned, they don't have a need for catcher. It's not just the immediate need of, you know, who's on the roster, obviously Wells and, you know, Trevino. <clears throat> but if you've been, 
If you've been following, Ben Rice is hitting bombs. Augustin Ramirez is hitting bombs. They got two good catchers in uh, double A. And then in addition to that, um, I mean, they're double A team, the Somerset Patriots. If you're not going to see that, I don't know why you would go to any other minor league team. I mean, you go out there right now, you'd, you'd see Dominguez, you'd see Spencer Jones, you'd see Ben Rice, you'd see Augustin Ramirez. I think you'd see Arias. I think Arias is on the, the team now. Um, sure. There's a lot of talent all over that double A team. It is, it's kind of disgusting when you think about it. And also a uh, triple A guy to keep an eye on. I mentioned him to you before. Um, just saying this to everybody. What if I told you the Yankees have a Jose Altuve clone in the minors, just sitting there. No oh, yeah, one's talking name? about him. Caleb Durbin, Caleb Durbin, this guy, okay. I was like, so I heard about it. Right. And I was like, wait a minute. He's never talked about. He's five, six, one eighty five. Never talked about guy. Just doesn't really get out. He doesn't really strike out. He struck out in his four seasons in the minors. He struck out 92 times. Seems like a candidate for second base. It does. Honestly, he's 24. You know, this is, uh, this is one of those guys like go back. Ivan Nova. He comes up not anywhere near the top 30 list of prospects. And he ends up being a pretty decent middle of the road starter. And he's in the rotation. That's who this guy reminds me of. Um, a guy that could sneak up and all of a sudden you're like, where'd he come from? And he's batting 299 in the majors. That's kind of what I could see from this guy. Uh, they are being very quiet about him for a reason. I don't think they want people to know who he is because they did that with John Cruz. They were like, we're not going to talk about him. We know what he's doing in the minors. We're not going to say anything. And then Miami's like, yeah, that John Cruz guy, you thought you could sneak him by. Well, if you want John Birdie, you're going to have to give us John Cruz. And so they did end up trading away John Cruz. But yeah, I think, I don't think Durbin's going to be traded away, Gary. I think he might actually be, you know, it'll, it'll be next year in uh, spring training. But I think to replace uh, Glaber, I think there's going to be a battle and I think he's going to be at the forefront of it. I'm fine with that. Um, I've said it before. I'm fine with Glaber Torres. The, <clears throat> the kind of the transition. I like Glaber Torres. I wouldn't be upset if they bring him back. But yeah, you have to pick battles. One of those, our first and foremost, our battle is Juan Soto. So um, that's our first battle. And when you bring in Aaron Judge, you that's already a sure thing. Thirty six million a year. We know what that contract is. And the next thing is hovering around mid thirty five, mid thirties a year. And we're already paying Juan Soto $31 million a year, so um, he's still going to be due for a raise and for a long time. So having said that, you do have to pick some guys out of the minor league system that you're comfortable with, and it's pretty easy to come up with that list when guys are productive in the minor leagues. Guys in AAA right now in Caleb Durbin, who's hitting two ninety nine, dollars probably the reason you chose that number, but he's still yeah. at 20 bats. Like He's an athlete, and of course he's an athlete. He's 5'6", 185, high guys are athletic at that spot. So, so we like what we see. Um, he's not the only candidate, as you mentioned, at for second base or for third base. Right. Um, but you know, we like what Cabrera is doing at third base. And then now, of course, he's kind of been phased out with the DJ LeMahieu arrival. But having said that the Yankees do have some options. They can get creative and it's not all doom and gloom. If Glaber Torres is on his way out the door, that's all we'll say. And do you know where they got, Caleb Durbin from Houston. No, they, they, no, that'd be funny. They got him from the Braves for Lucas Leitke. <laughs> if he ends terrible. up being the start, starting second baseman, I mean, is Luke, and he Lucas, walks. that's interesting. Yeah, he does. Wow. He's he's a fan favorite. So like if you go to the games, I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. You obviously know him. A lot of people know him. But if you don't go to the games, you don't know him. And so that's what that's pretty much what I'm saying. Uh Litge, by the way, uh was traded from the Yankees to the Braves in 2022. 
He's 35 years old at the time. And he immediately with the Braves had a 7-2-4 ERA. And I don't think he even plays anymore. So at least they that got would be that would be quite the uh the acquisition there if turning a 35 year old you know reliever in a year that i mean i don't know they didn't really need him and turning him into a potential starting second baseman down the road that'd be pretty nice but anyway we could go on and on and on and on and on and you know this could end up being the Caleb Durbin show at some point but not now he's still in triple a uh, appreciate you guys tuning in. Um, once again, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For 572 subscribers at the time of recording this, we are uh, anxiously awaiting to get to 1,000. Once we do that, we'll actually be fully monetized right now. If you do want to support the channel, you can leave a super thanks. Um, it, it, you know, Just a nice little donation. We've already gotten them, so we appreciate that. Um, if you don't want to, that's totally fine. It's just more so if you want to, but that's it. That's all we got for you guys. We'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Hopefully after another Yankees win, I don't want to say hopefully Gary, cause they have won a lot of games this year, most likely a Yankees win. But until next time, guys, I'm Jake Ellenbogen. He is Gary Sheffield jr. This has been Yankees unloaded and like this video. Oh, 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 oh